Senator Duckworth, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the Daily Social Distancing Show. <laughs> it's good to be on from afar. Yeah, from very far. Um, let's talk about um, the interesting world that you are a part of right now. As, as a senator, you are part of some of the biggest decisions that America needs to make during this crucial time. Um, you have to make those decisions by voting. I'm confused right now as to whether senators are coming back into session or not coming into session because it seems like there's a lot of contradictory information. I, 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 do you know what you're doing yet? We do not know what we're doing yet. I will tell you that we can pass this le legislation by unanimous consent. That's how we pass um, the latest bill that just passed last week. Um, uh, as long as it's a bipartisan compromise and we all agree on it, we can actually pass it with unanimous consent. Nobody is objecting. It can actually pass without senators physically being in the room. We are on calls all day negotiating. I was on four Zoom calls already today, only one of which was a preschool class of my five-year-old. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're acti actively working every day. Uh, but the legislation doesn't actually physically require us to be there um, unless somebody objects and says we want people to physically cast a vote. Right. Is there any reason anyone would have to want people to physically cast a vote during this time? I mean, it feels like an unnecessary risk for so many senators and their staff to be coming to D.C. to cast votes that they can be doing digitally in, in video form. Right, well, the votes can be done unanimously. So we have a couple of senators, you know, the, the senators from uh, Virginia, Maryland can go on the floor and can certainly, uh, you know, but, but actually Mitch McConnell can present um, the vote by unanimous consent. No one is there, no one objects, and then it just passes, which is what happened with COVID 3.5. Um, we don't physically need to be there. It's really, I think, mm -hmm. a dog and pony show that Mitch McConnell's trying to put on by calling everybody back. Um, and that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario, he's trying to bring us all back to help pass unqualified judges to really stack the courts for this Trump administration. Let's talk a little bit about the bill and its importance. You know, it, it's rare that we see bipartisan anything from America's government these days. Why do you think everyone is behind this bill? And, and what do you think the importance of this bill is? What do you hope it will achieve? Well, there are several things that I wanted to achieve. First, we need to get money to the hospitals. All these hospitals, these first responders, the folks on the front lines need the money to keep operating. I've talked yesterday to 38 hospitals in Illinois, uh, rural hospitals, and they're on the verge of collapse. Um, they need the money in order to keep operating and serving their communities. Uh, we need to make sure that we get uh, money into the system for our small businesses. In Illinois, 95% of our employers are small businesses. They're drowning. And the last bill that we passed, uh, uh, many of the big banks gamed the system um, and actually sent money to large corporations that didn't need it. In this version, um, we, are, we put guardrails around it and we set aside money, $70 billion, that will go to small businesses, in particular in small banks. Very important in communities like the South Side of Chicago for minority owned businesses that desperately need this money just to survive. Um, and then third, we need to make sure that uh, we are re able to reopen the economy and keep there to be an economy for us to reopen as we move forward. So let's take care of the first responders. Let's make sure there's testing. Let's make sure there's money for um, our small businesses. And that is something I think we can all agree on. Yeah, yeah it really feels like more than ever, um, citizens need the protection that their government can afford them because you know, we're learning so many things about how the coronavirus ad uh, adversely affects communities. Um, you are a senator representing Illinois. Um, Chicago is one of the hardest hit cities in America. And what we've also learned in Chicago is just like in many places in America, it is disproportionately affecting black and brown communities where we're starting to see the adverse effects of the world that they lived in beforehand being exacerbated by coronavirus. Are there any, any laws or any legislation that anyone is proposing that'll try and help those people specifically? Because it feels like a lot of laws get written almost with blinders on, but there comes a point when people say, do we fix the problem or do we act like the problem isn't affecting some in a different way to others? Well, you, you put your finger right on it, Trevor, and it's something I've been working on for a while now. Last year, I started the Environmental Justice Caucus in the Senate because... Um, the black and brown communities in and around Chicago, for example, are the ones that have disproportionate location of polluting industries. It's where, you know, these black and brown communities are where we put the industries that pollute the air and the environment. We have skyrocketing rates of asthma among African-American kids in Chicago. If you go from uh, the loop in Chicago and you go down 10 L stops, which is what we call our subway, um, the life expectancy dropped 20 years in 10 stops. That's just absolutely unacceptable. So we need to address these issues. Uh, with the COVID-19 right now, um, African-Americans, for example, are 15% of our population in Illinois, but they're 
43% of the cases of COVID-19, not just because of where they live and in the higher rates of, of illnesses that they have, but it's lack of access to healthcare and it's the jobs that they're holding. They're the janitors, they're the people working in the nursing homes, they're the people doing the really hard work that keeps our society going. So I'm working on several issues. I've been working on environmental justice to make sure we clean up the, uh, the environment um, in our black and brown communities and we give them the same rates of protection that we do for our more affluent suburbs. Um, and then we also need to make sure that we protect those workers who are on the front lines. We can't forget about the folks who are working the McDonald's drive through right now. They need a living wage and we need to support them. Mm -hmm. We can't forget about the janitor who's cleaning the hospitals right now because they need to be protected as well. Right. Um, a group that definitely needs protection right now, not just for themselves, but for the, 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 the health of the economy in America, is small businesses. You know, uh, we've been talking about how this um, loan program was meant to invigorate small businesses and to keep them afloat during the, the, the coronavirus shutdown. But as you said, big businesses um, got the money because banks found a way to game the system. Now, I know the Treasury has uh, put in some guidelines for this next round of funding, but is there, any gonna, is there gonna be any, any um, are there gonna be any ramifications? Like, you know, is anyone going to ask questions about where the money went, who the money went to? Are, are companies that didn't need the money gonna be forced to give the money back? How is that working? Well, I am joining a group of senators in a letter um, requesting exactly that. Where did the money go? Um, uh, how did those people get the money? Was it just because they all had relationships with Wells Fargo and Chase um, or whether uh, it went through small community banks? And then I wanna break it down by industry as well so that we know that the money is going out across the board to lots of different industries so that it's not just one industry that's getting the bulk of the money. And then in the 3.5 bill, we've actually put guidelines around it so that a lot of this money um, would go through small community banks and um, credit unions and the like to those are more likely to lend to small businesses, to mom and pop stores, that sort of thing. And in this next bill, COVID-4 that we're negotiating, we're making sure that we double down on that. And I wanna go back and take a look and see how exactly did the Trump administration distribute this money? Because I, I you know, I, I just don't, I, I don't trust the tr Department of Treasury under the Trump administration very much, unfortunately. I mean, I wish I could, but um, I just worry that they're not doing things where they're favoring small businesses as opposed to large corporations. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, the coronavirus itself. Um, we hear about task forces, we hear about teams that are working together. At one point I heard you were part of a team, but I haven't seen you as part of that team. And again, I, forgive me, but I don't understand. Are you part of the Corona task force that is deciding when to reopen the economy? Yes, I am part of the uh, task force to reopen the economy. Um, Dick Durbin and I are the two senators from the same state that are on the task force. Um, it was a surprise to me because I wasn't even asked. Um, I'm glad to be on it. Um, I'm gonna be pushing hard to make sure that before we reopen the economy in any way, we have enough testing both for um, whether or not people are positive, but also contact tracing and to make sure that we can uh, open the economy and not have to shut it back down again. How devastating would it be, Trevor, if we just let everybody out and then suddenly we have another wave of, of COVID positives and then we have to shut back down. I think that would be worse for our economy than to move forward in a methodical way. Our task force has only met once. We'd have one phone call for an hour. 45 minutes of that hour was spent with President Trump boasting on how great the testing was going in this country, how he had we had conducted more tests than any other country and that other countries were calling us, um, asking for us to give them tests, all of which are not true. Um, and when asked how, much, how many tests do we need for the country, the Trump administration had no answers. On a separate call with Vice President Pence, we asked him the same thing. How many, this is a basic math problem. You need to know how many uh, tests there need to, we need to have. For example, Israel tests their frontline healthcare workers every three days. You can do the basic math and figure out how many tests you need. And they don't know, they don't even know how many tests they have or how they're projected to have them. And so it's very frustrating working with this, this administration. It's why I pushed so hard to um, use the Defense Production Act. And I'm actually writing new language right now to include um, pandemic response in the Defense Production Act for testing supplies and PPE as well. Well, you know, changing gears for a moment before I let you go, you were the senator who made news for being the first senator to bring their child to work with them. And, um, you know, it was inspiring and it was amazing because there you were at work with your child. And now once again, you are at work with your child, but just both at home. And now you're at school with your child. Um, it's been quite a journey for yourself and for your family being, being the mother of two young kids. 
What has the hardest part of homeschooling slash spending the full day with them been? Well, the hardest part is really, uh, I want to spend all my time with them. And, and homeschooling, I think, is probably the hardest part. I'm homeschooling my daughter um, every day. Um, and I had great respect for her teachers before and our educators before. But right now, I, I mean, I would kiss her teacher's feet <laughs> because I am, I am blown away by how hard our educators work and, and how tough it is. And so I'm trying to homeschool my daughter. Um, but let me say something, Trevor. I have, I have a job. My job is paying me a salary. I cannot imagine what it must be like. You know, I'm, I can't imagine because my dad was in his 50s when he lost his job and my family was on food stamps and, 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 and we didn't have enough to eat. So there are a lot of families right now in this country that are hurting, who need help. Um, and that's what I'm focused on right now. And, and so, yeah, it's tough homeschooling my daughter, but it's no, nowhere near as hard as the janitor who's got to go show up to clean up a hospital who doesn't have the ability to homeschool her child. And now, you know, her salary doesn't make ends meet. And how is she going to get enough food for her family? So that's the family that I'm focused on. My family and I will be fine. I'm just work, worried about the working families out there. Well, Senator Duckworth, thank you so much for your time. And uh, good luck with the homeschooling. Thank you.